All right, we are at the hour. So welcome to another session of the AUS training series, where all topics tie back to the key tasks identified in the AUS position description, or PD. Since the PD says what we have to know how to do, this class series focuses on the skills and topics that speak directly to what the PD says. And we do that because if we can get the fundamentals covered, we'll do great things as AUSs and add that unique value to our facilities that only the AUS can. In this class, we will look at the single most important topic in contract writing, defining our requirements. I'm Stephen Clements, uh, Wisnick AUS, and I'll be your guide through this topic. I spent several years in VA contracting, switched sides to the good life of an AUS, and earned the highest contracting certification that used to be offered, the FACC Level 3. Now I just have the same FACC P as everybody else. Lost all those bragging rights. And uh, my lovely assistant for today is Carol Miller, the new Vanek AUS. And she'll be monitoring the chat because I might ask you some questions along the way, and she'll be happy to help with your general questions. If you have a question specifically for me, please hold it until the end of the class because we'll take all the time needed to discuss what's on your mind, and I'll show you where to get a copy of these slides. And as always, this class is being recorded, and please mute your mics and turn off your cameras until the end. We've discussed the term requirement before, so let's refresh our memory. What is a requirement? Please put your answer in the chat. What is it? Why does it go in a contract? It has the sound mint in it. So is this spearmint? Peppermint? Neither one? What do we think? Kathy has supporting documents. We have Nicola in need. Uh, Deborah, what is the government's needs? Um, mm -hmm. William, also in need. And Valerie, need for your facility. Okay, I'm hearing the word need a lot. Well, maybe, uh, maybe there's something to that. And the intended audience for this class is the AUS job series, although all are welcome. If you have any interest in contracting matters at all, there's going to be plenty that this class and the rest of the AUS job series has to offer you. And our task and purpose will get us to our desired outcome, and those are tasks to familiarize the AUS with how to define and write our contract requirements. Our purpose in doing so is to ensure the AUS is properly equipped to independently write requirements documents and advise their customers on how to do the same. Our desired outcome is that attendees will learn what a requirement is, the different ways to describe them, the details that need to be included, and how to write requirements documents. And we'll meet those criteria by looking at topics such as what is a requirement? What does the AUS have to do with them? How do we define our requirements? And once we know what they are, how do we write them? We'll explore several examples, finish by summarizing what we covered, and I will point you to opportunities for further training. So what is a requirement? Unfortunately, neither our authoritative sources or interpretive sources provide a definition for that. So I had to resort to a standard English language definition of the term, and I quote the Oxford, Oxford Language Dictionary, which says a requirement is a thing that is needed or wanted. If we look closely and squint at what our sources have to say, we can infer some more details. The VHA Procurement Guide 802-101 identifies in the entries for both non-recurring and recurring requirements that it is goods or services that are needed on different timescales. And Customer Reference Guide 7121 gives us this, that this detailed requirement from the customer identifies the actual need. So from all this, it becomes clear that a contract requirement we have is a good or service needed to fulfill the VA's mission, which is serving veterans. In the requirements package class we had, one of the documents we send to contracting is a requirement description, or as we called it then, generically, PWS. And I'll probably slip into calling them PWSs uh, in this class sometimes too, when uh, speaking generically. 
Uh, to refresh our memories and put this class in context, let's take a moment to define what a requirements document is. It is a document that states what you need in terms of functions to be performed, performance required, or essential characteristics, and that comes from FAR 11.02A2I. And there's different terms for these things, such as SOW, SOO, SSC, and PWS. And as I said, when I speak generically, I'm going to call them all a PWS because it's an ingrained habit. Now, what is the AUS's role in defining requirements? Please put your answer in the chat. Do we have a role to play? Are the rest of these slides going to be empty? Because it turns out we don't. Do we define the requirements as AUS's? Do other people define requirements? Does contracting define our requirements? I'll give you a second. Donald has assistance, Emmanuel. Yes, we have a role to play. Okay. James also assists, and Brian, the customer, defines what we assist. Hmm. Provide guidance to customers in defining their requirements. Miranda, yes. Donald, endorser mostly. Jeanette, make sure they are generic to avoid protests. Carla, for our own contracts and assist guide for the facilities. Nicola, right. assist in the procurement. I think uh, this, uh, this is sounding interesting. Like maybe there's more than one person that has something to say with about defining <laughs> requirements. So I took a look at the PD and see what it had to say um, that speaks about what does the AUS have to do with this. And it had pages of lines speaking, speaking directly to our involvement. The AUS is supposed to be an expert at acquisition planning uh -huh. and oversight. And please mute your mics if you're not me or Carol. And the single most important part of both is defining the requirement. We develop supporting artifacts for the requirements package, including the PWS, which we must be capable of writing independently. We review documents for others, and we either define or help define what the performance requirements are. Again, we review procurement package documents for our customers, uh, our service lines. We work with them to define what they need from contractors and lead them in defining their requirements and quality assurance surveillance plans. Speaking of quality assurance, we're to take it seriously, and you can only define how it can be done if you have a well-defined requirement. And we see more about advising and assisting. So a bunch of y'all mentioned in the term assist. Well, we advise and assist both customers and contracting in as appropriate, writing the requirements, communicating them to the public, and monitoring contract performance and compliance. And so why do we, the AUSs, have these roles in defining requirements? Well, in 2016, the AUS position was created to advise our customers on this and other topics. When we defined what a requirement docu or requirements document was, we cited the procurement guide and customer reference guide but we did not cite contracting's procurement manual okay. because that source is silent on how to define requirements. The PM is silent because defining requirements is not contracting's job. It is contracting's job to decide how we get what we want, but it is our job to define what that is. CRG 7 states it is the customer who defines the requirement, drafts the documentation for it, and to consider contracting's advice on how to improve it. CRG 2.2 states explicitly that the AUS will make sure their acquisition package will be sound and to help the customer from start to finish in the contracting process. When you take all that in, at the end of the day, it is we. And that we consists of our customers and ourselves as AUSs that own the PWS. If it's a great PWS, we get the credit. Credit. If it's a terrible one, we have no one to blame but ourselves, and it's not contracting's job to define the requirement. And to ask a basic question, why do we have to define requirements at all? I mean, we're talking about defining them. Well, why? Why do we do that? Can't we just have a fuzzy idea of what we want, obligate some money, hire a contractor? We can figure it out as we go, right? Right? We could just do that. I know some people uh, will effectively do that. Well, wrong, because that violates the bona fide need rule, because we wouldn't have a defined need. And there are a host of other reasons we have to do our best to make sure our requirements are clearly and accurately defined. We're going to cover many of those uh, reasons in this class. 
And since the PWS is where we define what we need and have to have, and nothing else will do, every other document we're going to write depends on how well we define our need there. So we have to get it right. It is critically important that we be clear in describing what we need, the terms and conditions under which we will accept it, and that we capture our true needs based on the facts on the ground. A requirement description is what we use to judge a contractor's work by and decide if they earn their check or not. If we write a PWS that misses key details, gets basic facts wrong, or is for a need we don't really have, our customers and veterans will not be well served. So to recapitulate a little bit of, uh, of what we've covered, the PWS or requirements description is the single most important document of the requirements package. And we are required to send one to contracting. If a detail is not written into your PWS, it is not a requirement because it's not written in there. You didn't capture it. And if we need to add something after award you know, to the contract, the contractor can just say no, they're not gonna do it, or they can ask us for more money. So a well-defined PWS helps us get what we want at a fair price and avoid problems and protests. Now, while the FAR did not define the term requirement for us, it does have FAR Part 11 called Describing Agency Needs. And while you should read the whole thing, here are some key points from it, uh, in that it orders us to describe what we need through two key lenses. One, specify needs using market research in a manner designed to promote maximum competition and only ask for restrictions truly needed by the item. And two, state requirements with respect to an acquisition of item items in terms of functions needed, level of performance required, or essential characteristics. You'll note it doesn't mention uh, throw a brand name in there and call it a day because FAR 11105 orders us to not require to not write requirements so as to require only one manufacturer's product if we can avoid it. Our other references have this to say. The VAR has nothing we need to worry about. The uh, VHAPG, it doesn't address FAR Part 11, so we can skip that one. The Customer Reference Guide, now this one, it gives us a helpful overview, and, then, and it's Appendix A is an excellent writing guide for describing requirements. I used it a lot while preparing this class. And Appendix A has a list of publications you might find helpful from the NCMA. Who knows what the NCMA is? Please drop your answers in the chat. Has anybody heard of it? No Googling. Either you know it or you don't. So, Carol, when we start getting some answers, please let me know. Have our fellow AUSs heard of the NCMA? So far, don't know. No. Nope. Nope. Yes. Okay. Um, we had. Oh, we got one. Marie yes. Says yes. Marie. Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, Jeanette acquisition manual. Hmm. NCMA would be the National Contract Management Association. That's a professional group for the development and support of contracting professionals. Um, I ran into it when I was in contracting up in New England, went to a few of their meetings in, uh, in the Boston metro area. And if there's a chapter near you, I'd recommend you pay them a visit, maybe join up, uh, because the meetings I went to were very informative. And in the presenter's notes, when you get a hold of these slides, I put the website showing where NCMA chapters are located um, for your use. And finally, another source or another reference we have uh, regarding defining a requirement, VABIT has a variety of sample requirement definitions or PWSs for you to use. And so that could be a, a very valuable resource for you. And so in defining our requirements, there are certain questions we need to ask. And by asking and answering them, we build our requirements document with all the details we need to know about what we want and the details contracting needs to work with. And we're going to go over the finer details in future slides. But writ large, the questions are, what do you need? Where is it needed? When do you need it? And for how long? How do you want it done? 
what kind of company can do it, which regulations and standards apply to the thing you want done, and how will we monitor contractor performance? And so since those are the big questions, here are the specific details we need to answer those questions. And each of these topics also gets a slide that looks at them in greater depth. If you write out the key details you and your customer can think of regarding the need, you know, just following this list along, you will have a quality requirements description. And uh, there's different ways to format the information, but this is, these are the details that you need. So for procurement background, we should describe the situation surrounding the need to put it in context. What need are you trying to meet for your facility? How will this contract help serve our veterans? Which service line or customer is this going to serve? Is it for the eye clinic? Is it for the mailroom, engineering? What impact will we experience if we can't get a contract in place to meet the need? And after providing that background, we must describe what it is that we want. Do you need services, supplies, both, construction, medical professionals, a lease, something else? Are there certain tasks you want to specifically instruct the contractor on? Are there industry standards that apply to the requirement? One way to find out is to use market research, like FAR 11 told you to, to determine what those standards might be. You should describe your desired results and expectations. And when describing your requirement, make no assumptions of your audience's understanding of the need. If you need a hospital bed, say hospital bed, not just bed. If you need a liver transplant surgeon, don't say surgeon, list the specialty. Be specific. Assume that the people who are looking at this have no idea what you're talking about. And another important detail is how much do you need? Do you need one dental 3D imaging device? Or do you need a thousand labor hours a week to support uh, a task for your vision? And what about location and moving people and uh, moving things around for the requirement? You know, you know, start with where is the requirement? Where do you need the thing? And is the requirement needed at one location or is it at multiple locations? Where will the supplies or services be delivered to? Uh, name the location, provide the addresses. And how do you get what you need from where it is to where it needs to go? As in, do you need delivery within three days after you make a phone call? Or do you want the contractor to come by every Tuesday for years doing what you asked them to? Be specific. And what about technician travel and item shipping? It takes fuel for technicians to visit our facilities. It takes time for them to travel. If the technician has to be on site several days in a row, where are they going to stay? Are they local and they're just going to stay at their house? Or are they traveling and they're going to need a hotel? Did you tell the contractor which costs are allowable and not allowable contract costs? Because the GSA has guidelines for that, which you could include in your uh, PWS. And for shipping, do you want the freight cost to be calculated from the point of origin from where it gets shipped out? Or do you want the freight cost to be calculated from the uh, point of delivery where it arrives? This matters. And how do you want the contractor to price that? Do you want them to price those separately, uh, those shipping costs separately from the item you're buying? Or do you want them to roll those costs into the per unit price? You know, these are your things we need to address. Period of performance. How long do you want the vendor to do what you asked them to do? When do you want them to start? And when do you want them to stop? Um, is there a deadline that you need these items for? Or is there a time when you need, absolutely need for these services to start? Is this a one-time delivery of pencils or is this a daily service technician need? And uh, if this item or service is always needed, did you build in options um, to your uh, planning documents to where you can get more without having to go out and make a brand new contract? And what increments are those options measured in? Are they in years? Are they in additional uh, you know, number of widgets that you uh, that you can order. Contractor qualifications. Are there certain qualifications the vendor has to have? Are there specific licenses needed to do the work you're asking them to do? Are there specific training programs they need to have gone through in order to do this job? And what about degrees, experience, specific certifications? 
Because for example, if your requirement is for electrical repair work, it's a good idea uh, to put in a requirement for vendors to prove they're licensed by your state to do electrical work. Or say you need to order medical gas deliveries. What regulations does your state and does the federal government have on transportation of those items? Uh, you should specify that potential contractors need to prove they have the certifications and equipment necessary to meet those regulations. Also, list your minimum requirements for all those things we talked about. And if you have applicable standards, be specific what they are. Cite them. Uh, what's the FAR reference number that requires certain qualifications? What's the regulation called and where can they find it? At, provide a current link to where the standard can be found. Uh, for example, if you're buying paper for the federal government, what percentage of the paper is post-consumer fiber that these vendors are offering you? Because FAR 11303A requires at least 30% recycled content. And did you check the FAR to see if it had something to say about all this? And will you be providing any government furnished property, equipment, or information? If yes, what are you planning to provide to potential vendors? And what are the terms for its use? Is it a forklift? Is it a stockpile of bricks a contractor can use to build a retaining wall that they don't have to buy? Are there conditions that apply to using those things? Um, if it's a vehicle, is the contractor or the VA responsible for buying fuel to refuel the vehicle? And are we providing electricity for the contractor's owned equipment, or do they need to bring along their own generator? And then where do they store it? You know, uh, how does it get powered? These might be details that are important for you. Meetings and reports. Do you want meetings built into the contract? And what topics will those meetings address? Who has to be there? What does the contractor owe you at those meetings and what do you owe them? Do you want the vendor to give you reports? Um, and you know, for meetings, one example meeting is a kickoff meeting. Um, a lot of people write those into their contracts and I definitely recommend you hold those because it can help uh, customers and vendors have a meeting of the minds at the beginning of the contract and ensure they're on the same page in what what needs to be in what needs to be done and who needs to do the coordinating to get it done. And uh, for reports, do you want the contractor to generate reports on what they're doing? Uh, for example, uh, my predecessor wrote into several WISNIC contracts that after the end of every fiscal year, she wanted the vendor to create reports showing volume ordered and total price savings over open market pricing. Well, they might have been great for her. When I took a look at them, I didn't find them to be helpful, um, so I don't write those into my contracts, uh, but that's an example uh, of something you could ask for. A non-recurring report might be a site survey of your entire facility's electrical infrastructure, how well it works, and if there's any problems with it. That could be what the contract's for, a contract deliverable, um, the thing that you're paying them to produce. And do you write any meetings or reports into your contracts? Please let us know in the chat. And please. I know. Okay, I'll mute you for you. Because Bobby doesn't look it up. He just. Let's say people. I will. I will. Mute all. I okay, that is most unfortunate. All right, so now that uh, we're done hearing about Bobby's day, where were we? So, yeah, please drop your answers in the chat. If you have written meetings or reports in any of, any of your requirements, um, and if you haven't, feel free to drop a no. There's no wrong answers here. I'm just curious. Richard has, not normally, but if if called for, I would write them in. Some say okay. yes, we had a bunch say yes, some no. Uh, Christopher says not yet. Michael, not yet. Uh, Carla says have no need to. And Jeffrey says yes, sometimes. Um, Roberta, yes. Amy, yes, on reporting. Okay. And Nicola, no. Um, All right. Julia says yes, I'd like to build meetings in the contract. I just had to do one on a bi weekly meeting to provide updates. 
All right. Well, that's uh, we got a lot of variety out there. Yeah, because some of your uh, some of your contracts it wouldn't make any sense. Um, do you need to have a meeting to you know, get a delivery of pencils? But if uh, you have more uh, more complicated requirements, you know, it's a good idea. And so moving on, you should define what you will have at the end of the contract. You're hiring the contractor to give you something you don't already have, and whatever you define that to be is a deliverable. Uh, whatever it is, make clear what it is so you can be sure you get it. Because at some point, uh, your customer, your service line, maybe even you, are going to have to check the box saying received in Vista. So be specific in describing what it is your customer needs to see in order to be able to honestly check that block. And we've got an example here on the screen, or a few examples on the, on the screen. And what role does the core have in the contract? Some contracts don't even have cores because the CO wants to retain absolute control. But some others don't have cores because they're so simple that they don't need a VA employee with core training to manage them. Well, which, well, what do you want? Do you want a point of contact? Do you want a core? Is the CO going to hold on to all of it? Spell that out. And if you do have a core or a point of contact, are they simply checking the invoices and authorizing payments? Or do they have broad discretion in how the contract terms can be applied? How much decision-making authority is the CO delegating to the core after award? I've seen it done where the CO awards a contract with a pot of money and tells the core or the POC to order whatever they want from the price cost schedule. Just be sure to tell the CO when they've spent 75% of the money. And you can bake the core's role into the requirement to make sure everyone understands the part they have to play. And security requirements. What level of security me. in seriously? I've already muted y'all once. Who got unmuted? Okay. So what level of security and background checks do you need for your requirement? If you're ordering a bunch of Tic Tacs, you probably don't need much. But if you're hiring medical professional services and the contractor will have access to sensitive veteran health information, there are a lot of security hoops they'll need to jump through. If so, there are forms you'll need to fill out and send to the right VA department to process. Also, the people who process those requests are typically backed up. So how will you account for delays in onboarding contractor personnel? Because the contractor can't make the VA move any faster. So we can't blame them if the delay is our fault. And what key details about the facility does the potential contractor need to know? What are the times your clinics are open? So the medical professionals know when to be there and the hours repair, te uh, repair technicians might have to work around. Is there a limited amount of space available for the new MRI machine? That can make a big difference and save you a lot of headaches if you've got that answer ahead of time. And the answers to these questions can impact how the contractor can give us what we want and we owe it to the contractor to give them as complete a picture as possible. These factors could impact who's even willing to quote on our solicitations, how much they'll charge us, and our chances for success. And now this list isn't all inclusive and you should add your own factors to it, uh, but these are the core questions uh, your requirements document uh, needs to answer. Next is our Quality Assurance Surveillance Plan. The QASP is a set of objectives and measurements we develop to tell us if the contractor is doing what we asked for or not. Every contract needs a plan, simple or complex, on how we're going to track our contractor performance. Nobody's perfect, not even contractors, so what is the minimum level of quality re we require? If we hire someone to cleanly cut 100 sticks in half and they break but not cut, Two of them is a 98% success rate allowable or not. If 98% is fine, but more breaks happen, what then? Do we dock 10% off the next invoice? Do we terminate the whole contract? We have options, and it's up to us to decide what we will and will not allow. If it's a delivery of Tic Tacs, 
The quasp could be as simple as, did the Tic Tac show up on time and in the quantity ordered? Yes or no, pass or fail. No delivery or late delivery means no payment. If the PWS says, the grass shall be between two and three inches in length, the quasp might say, 98% of the grass examined shall be between two and three inches in length as measured by the Corps every Wednesday at noon Central Standard Time. Now, the CO or core must be willing and able to do the monitoring for it to be an effective tool. So with the grass cutting example, if the core doesn't work on Wednesday, change the day. If they don't know how to measure grass, you might want to pick a different metric. And the Wisnik uh, contract SharePoint site has a QASP template you can use if you want to see uh, what one looks like if you haven't before, and you can customize it however you want. And I included a link to it in the presenter's notes for you to check out once you get the slides, and uh, we'd be happy for you to use it. So now we're going to take a quick break from the walls of text and look at the need to accurately describe your requirements a different way. When I first saw this comment, it, uh, comic, it spoke to my soul, and I thought it uh, just might speak to yours as well. And all the problems illustrated by each of the uh, each of the panels, they can be solved by proper documentation and communication of the requirement. And one more humorous example that uh, a member of the audience gave me uh, last year. And if your customer has sent in as a requirement that we we need a contractor to build an air and space museum. And that was all the detail they gave us. Would the contractor be wrong for giving us this? And taking that full paycheck for doing it. Specifications do matter. Yeah, Brian says, nope, Richard, nope. Jeffrey, <laughs> no. Yeah. They built a building. <laughs> That's true. They I mean, there, there is air in here and there is space. Uh, Three-dimensional space, maybe even four-dimensional space. And we didn't even ask for that, but they gave us that extra. Um, so. like, no. Everybody says no. Okay. <laughs> so all the details we just talked about, we're going to format those differently depending on what you're buying and how you want the requirement to be met. Uh, there's four general formats for describing requirements. And we have them listed here. You got your statement of work, SOW, performance work statement, PWS. Statement of Objectives, SOO, and Statement of Salient Characteristics, SSC. And the next slides, we're going to look at each one in detail, both what the regulations say about them and what they might look like. And so this is what the FAR states an SOW has to cover. It looks a lot like the points we've already addressed. FAR 8405-2 states that SOW shall describe the work to be performed, location of the work, period of performance, deliverable schedule, and applicable performance standards and other requirements, like all the things we just talked about. The PG gives us the philosophy of the SOW. We define the requirement by describing what we're trying to do and defining the way we want it done. And this is the perfect type of description for the would-be micromanager that wants to spell out every little thing they want the contractor to do. That's what the PG gives us. So key elements of a statement of work. It's a detailed description of specific tasks required, including how the contractor will perform those tasks. So if there's painting involved, uh, you, a statement of work could be used to tell them how to hold the brush and how to form the strokes. It can get that specific. And it's used when the government is directing the contractor on how to perform the work. And these are generally used for service contracts. An example of which might be, you tell your son that on Monday night at 8 p.m., he shall roll your trash cans to the curb and place them one foot to the right of the driveway with the lids of the cans closed. Do you, does anybody see a problem with this requirement definition? Please drop your answers in the chat. We identify who'll do the work. 
what day and time he will do it. That he will roll, not push, the trash cans. Won't carry them, he will roll them. Where he'll take them, and that the lids will be closed. Oh, Miss Miller, as the audience's answers uh, come on in, please let me know what thoughts they might have on problems they could pick out of that example. Or maybe it's the perfect example, and they're all sitting there in awe. Hey, of, uh, I think they're in awe. This, uh, that could be it. This can be too specific. The rolling could be problematic. Uh, missing the type of trash can roll does not specify on wheels. How do you roll the can? Is it clear? <laughs> <laughs> so if the rolling might not be on wheels, does that mean you close the lid, turn it on its side and then roll it like a barrel? Oh, I hadn't thought of that one. <laughs> does not provide contingency if problem arises. Date. Mm. What's what driveway address? What happens? The trash mm -hmm. can is picked up. Some tasks are implied. Maybe. The right of the driveway is looking at the driveway or looking away from the house. Mm. Does mm. say what size of can, which Monday, one or every. Exactly. Is that's, it the uh, right day? That That's okay. right. I said, uh, you know, and um, is this something we want only one Monday night or do we want it done every one? Like, uh, like was mentioned, how many trash cans is he rolling? And we mentioned a driveway, but whose driveway? Is it ours? Is it the neighbor's? Uh, why is the location to the right of the driveway? Is that a requirement from the garbage company? In which case we might want to reference that. Or did we impose that standard? And the lids of the cans will be closed, but does that mean the trash cans? Since I didn't specify what kind of can. Or would our son be wrong if he made sure that every, say, aluminum can that was in the trash can he went in and manually closed every one of them before he did anything else. And so this highlights the importance of being precise because in an SOW where we spell out every detail, if the vendor follows our instructions to the letter and gets it wrong, as in doesn't give us what we thought we were asking for, but they get it reasonably wrong, we still have to pay them because it's not the vendor's fault. We didn't make our requirements clear enough. And so the second type we'll talk about is that acronym I've used many times, a performance work statement. And um, this is in the family of requirements descriptions. Big VA wants us to do the most because VA has a stated preference for, for, for performance-based contracting. Uh, because Big VA wants us to do that because nobody knows how to do the contractor's job better than the contractor. The more detailed instructions we give them, the more chances we have of ordering our contractors to do a worse job because we aren't hip to the state of the art like they are. We are less likely to be the source of innovation than the companies who live and die by their ability to provide greater value than their competition. Performance-based contracting is where we tell the contractor what we want done and then give them freedom in how they do it. And there's two types of description requirements that are performance-based the PWS and the SOO. And of the two, I find the PWS a more comfortable one to work with because um, at least my interpretation of it, it's a happy medium of, in level of detail between an SOW and a SOO. The VHA PG part 802 gives us a more detailed write-up describing the PWS this way. It is a form of a SOW that is used for performance-based contracting instead of being process-oriented as a typical SOW, as in how you will do things, a PWS is results-oriented, as in what am I getting, and places the burden of accomplishing the desired results on the contractor. This means that the government advises what the end result should be without attempting to describe how to get to the end result. And so if we have an SOW where we instruct the uh, contractor how to do something, and they do exactly that, and it winds up that we wind up ordering not what we wind up getting, not what we wanted. This is the opposite of that. We tell them what we want to get at the end and give them freedom how to get it to us. So what does a PWS need to address? 
It has fewer, it provides fewer detailed instructions than a SOW, but more than a SU. And key elements include a description of the task to be performed to achieve the desired results. Um, so we're just saying the task, not how to do the task. And we use it when the government knows what it wants and wants the vendor to determine how to perform the work. And it's generally used for service contracts. Our example here is that you tell your son he must have the trash cans ready for the garbage truck scheduled pickup each week. And uh, this example is less detailed in its instructions in the SOW, but does it do the job? Well, let's think. It tells our son what needs doing, how often we need it done, and that whatever he does needs to account for what the garbage truck requires in order to pick up the trash can. This requirements description puts the details of how to do the work on our son's back instead of us having to spell it out for him. The PWS doesn't care if our son takes a trash can out at Monday night at 8, 8, 8 p.m., Tuesday morning at 3 a.m., where the trash can needs to go or what to do with the lids. Our PWS cares about our trash cans being ready for the garbage truck to pick them up every week. How our son accomplishes that, we don't care. So does that look good or do you see any potential problems with that? Please let us know in the chat. Jerry says, shouldn't the PD PWS list qualifiable measurements the vendor needed to meet? Um, Christopher says, better. Use trash cans, mm -hmm. quantifiable. Okay, so we got some room for improvement. Okay. Son's name, PDF, um, Carla says PWS needs more specifics. And Donald also, more exact elements. Emmanuel still needs more detail. What about recyclables? Okay, yep, these are good things. Well, I'm glad you are picking up on all that. Um, that is good, good. And now the moving on to the statement of objectives, the Sioux, the, I, I find this one to be a wild one in the nerdy world that is uh, acquisitions. When writing your solicitation, all you do is tell the vendors what end goal you have in mind, tell them the details they need to know about conditions on the ground, and then you let them tell you their plan for meeting the requirement. You do not tell them how to do the job at all. You tell them the end goal. And the vendors tell you what tasks they will do, what the work schedule would look like, and fill in the rest of the details on how you meet your requirement. So when your CO uh, uh, goes to make an award, they'll take the, uh, the winning contractor's work plan from the solicitation, insert it into the final contract, and that then becomes the contract's PWS or, uh, yeah, uh, PWS. And the PG adds this text. It does say that this is the preferred approach for describing agency needs, but I doubt many COs will be comfortable with this lack of detail. And read the last part there. And SOO provides maximum flexibility to permit each offerer to propose its own approach. And SOO does not define tasks for the vendors, only the deliverables sought. And so our key terms for an SOO is for the solicitation, State what your end goal is. That uh, You tell the vendors key details that they need to know, like where you want it. The awarded contract will state the requirement definition uh, you wrote and the contractor's plan to beat it. And it's also generally used for service contracts. An example I'd give running with the common theme is, I want my trash disposed of, son. Surprise me. And that's, an, that's a short example, but that's technically all we need to do to give our son an SOO. We don't care how our trash disappears. We just want it gone. We want to know what his plan is. We might in, add in some applicable local laws on trash disposal, but we don't have to because we told him what our end goal was. Uh, the vendor in an SOO is still responsible for following laws applicable to trash disposal whether we include them on in our requirement or not. All right, a statement of salient characteristics. Well, what does the FAR have to say about SSCs? You're not gonna find it in the FAR, but you do need 
something like this if you're buying supplies. Because FAR 11002A2C states that we shall describe supply requirements in terms of essential physical characteristics and that we must avoid sole sourcing supplies or limiting them to specific brand names unless we have a compelling reason and a justification to go with it. And FAR 11104B tells us that if we do have that thing, if we do have that requirement, we have to define what that brand name provides that other products do not. And that we have to be open to equal products that happen to have a different name. So key terms of writing up a statement of salient characteristics is that we have to describe the essential physical and functional features of the material or service required with details like how big does the item need to be? What material does it need to be made of? What functions does it have to be able to do? Not what is it nice for it to do, what is absolutely required? And does it need to work with existing equipment or infrastructure? So ask yourself, uh, is it the minimum I need and is it well-defined without being overly restrictive? Those are the key, that's the key philosophy you're looking for here. And you generally use this for supply contracts. And so to continue with our working example, so we're going to switch gears a little bit and go for a supply. We need the vendor to provide us with trash receptacles, both durable carts and expendable bags. So for the durable carts, we need one and it shall meet these requirements. Be of durable, rigid plastic construction. So we don't want metal. Um, I don't think that's unduly restrictive. Uh, it should be designed for use with dump truck forklifts or their... Uh, their uh, uh, their grab arm devices. And it needs to have rolling wheels capable of bearing up to 500 pounds. And it needs to be capable of holding approximately you know, X number of cubic feet of material. And we're going to need bags to put in those durable carts. And we'll get one per week. So we need 52 of them. We're defining this requirement. We could define uh, however many we want. But these bags are going to meet these requirements. They shall be constructed of biodegradable materials, capable of storing, storing 30 pounds of loose material each, be pine or lavender scented, packaged in biodegradable packaging, capable of holding all 52 bags. So, you know, that's how we could write that up. And so, how do we write these things? Well, here's some tips and tricks I've uh, picked up along the years to help guide uh, myself, and maybe they'll be beneficial to you in defining your requirement. Be clear when writing it up. Avoid using vague, indefinite, and uncertain terms. Define what your key terms mean in the document. Um, and it could be as simple as putting the, the term itself, colon, and then the definition you want it to have in that context. And don't use words with double meanings. And don't use slang. Um, using professional industry jargon, you, you can do that, but do include a definition of what that jargon is early on. And write clear, concise sentences, and those sentences should be simple and use standard vocabulary to the, mo to the greatest extent possible. And when you are using terms, use them as consistently as you can throughout all the documents. So your PWS should describe the requirement the same way as your market research report, as your acquisition plan, as your sole source justification, to where uh, a person reading those documents won't be confused as they move from document to document to document. And uh, again, identify only the minimum requirements that you need and absolutely have to have in order to do um, uh, uh, to, to to get to meet your requirement and lay out the PWS in a logical format and group related ideas. So don't have uh, a section about uh, the specifications of your durable carts. Uh, then you go to three unrelated sections. And then at the end of the fourth section after the spot where you describe the durable carts have a critical detail about the critical or, or the durable carts. Get them all, get all the relevant information in one spot to the, to the best of your ability. Um, and start from an example PWS and rewrite it. And you've probably seen this a lot. Um, and, uh, it, you know, doing, um, 
doing this wrong can create serious problems um that your customers will send you the same pws they've recycled for the past four contracts and they've not given it a second thought this is a problem because things change facilities change requirements change and we should absolutely use old pws's for inspiration and as guides and as sources of ideas but we need to verify that our needs are accurately captured every time so if a customer tries passing the exact same PWS they used on the last contract to you, don't let them do it. Go over it with them line by line to make sure that the PWS you send to contracting is up to date and accurately describes the requirement. One big no-no I've seen in the past is when the customer sends in as their requirements description a vendor's product brochure. Well, Customer Reference Guide 8.8 .8 states to not do that. It's a bad idea and supposedly illegal. So I told my customers I couldn't use it because it's not a statement of work or statement of selling characteristics. It's a marketing brochure. And I told the customer they'd have to write it up in their own words uh, for me to use. No well, spoiler. Um, uh, what did they do? They just copy and pasted the text from the vendor's brochure into a word file and sent it to me thinking that was going to do the trick. Well, it didn't. Um, and uh, I, we eventually got a, a workable requirements description that, that meets these requirements and lazy PWS writing results in more trouble down the line than it's going to save than doing it right up front because believe me when your solicitation copy and pasted from one vendor's product brochure or written by a vendor hits the street there's going to be plenty of SVSBs and VSBs who'll be glad to let you know how unduly restrictive it is and your CO will get protested because we didn't do our due diligence in defining the requirement because we have to define our requirements and nobody else. All right, so it's gonna be Safari time. And this time we're gonna take a look at what a thorough PWS looks like. We're gonna take a visit to uh, a resource I mentioned earlier, VA Bit, and take a look at a sample solicitation I really like. And in case you've never been to VA Bit, I'm gonna show you what that looks like. And there is a link also in the presenter's notes. So when you get the slides, you can go right to it. And this is what it looks like. So here's a landing page. And what is VA bit is this the VHA acquisition business intelligence tool. I'm not sure that that's the terms I would use, but what this is, is a repository for all kinds of sample contract documents you might want. You want market research reports. They've got sample ones of those. Do you want PWSs or statement of sale characteristics? They've got those. Do you want source selection plans, quasps, this, that, and the other? There's all kinds of sample documents in here that you can use and that I have used. Um, and one trick I just found out within the last year is it doesn't matter which one of these buttons you hit, they're going to take you to the same place. So I'm just going to grab one of these. And on the next page, we're going to see that here the button does matter what you hit because the requirements and the related documents are broken out by different types of things you might buy so if you want a supply you go over here if you're doing construction prosthetics uh, probably leasing over here medical services regular services or they've all got their own areas and the one i have in mind to share is a service and i have used it awarded WISNIC contract package and so by extension many of uh, you have used it and here we've got a folder for all kinds of different requirements armored car services CBOC janitorial services COVID-19 stuff dental services home oxygen on and on and on it doesn't cover every conceivable requirement that you might have but if you've got a new requirements package absolutely stop here and take a look to see if uh, if you have samples that you can work with, because it might not get you a hundred percent solution, but it'll get you a good start that you can build off of. Like this American Sign Language Interpreting Services, I came here and uh, clicked into that, and then you've got market research, and it it's uh, you can review those of others and to upload your own. They encourage uh, folks to submit their own documents to share and uh, kind of pay it forward. And I went and mined their sample PWS pretty heavily. 
All right, got that open. So here we go. They have a performance work statement. Starting at the top, uh, this VA healthcare system uses American Sign Language Interpreting Services to do these things. And oh, this looks a lot like the background that we talked about that we need to have in our contract packages. And then we have a description of assignments. Okay, so these are, we've got, uh, we need people who are available upon request 365 uh, days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Okay, these sounds like some important work terms that we need prospective vendors to be able to uh, service us with. And who are we servicing? Uh, for deaf and hard of hearing employees, patients, and their families, along with visitors for the offices and agencies associated with the healthcare system. Okay, the government shall not exercise any supervision or control over the contract assignment providers pro performing the assignments described therein. These are all terms that speak to those questions we talked about. Locations here, you would specify what locations are being serviced and on and on. And here, oh, we got someone talking about what the core does. We got uh, times of day, we got all kinds of stuff that goes right to oh interpreter qualifications and requirements minimum of five years experience doing this kind of thing and certifications talks about certifications it's all kinds of stuff that speaks directly to the questions that we went over and here's a i think this is a stellar example of a pws that um uh, you could use to uh, as a as a reference model and we're gonna get back to the slides and finish up All right. And so now that we've talked about defining our requirements at length, let's summarize some key takeaways. Again, using the PWS term generically, the PWS is the most important contract document because everything else is based on what it says. And writing it is solely the customer's duty. Again, not contracting. And if contracting tries redefining your requirement for you, they are wrong. And please, okay, I'll mute you. Mia, please don't do that in the future. All right, and so it is our job to get to tell contracting what it is we require and their job on how they get it for us. We both have tasks. Uh, we have a separation of uh, labor here. We both have things to do. And so we should use our available guides, checklists, regulations, and experience to best describe our requirements because the right PWS will add value to your customer, help get the best deal, and help you get what you need from contracting. And while this is much time as we have to cover this topic, to learn more about defining requirements, I recommend these two classes. CLM 031 is a short paced self paced or short self-paced class available on Cornerstone On Demand to sharpen your skills. And FQN 427 goes far more in depth, clocking in at three days for an instructor-led course. Again, you register for a session through CSOD and more practice will benefit you and your customers. And so now we get to my last question to you, my beloved and exceedingly good looking, above average in every respect audience. Did you find that this class helped you learn for the first time or refresh your knowledge of defining requirements? If so, great. What would you find most helpful? If not, what did we miss? What would have made this more helpful? We want to make these classes as useful as possible in the time allotted, so please put your answer in the chat or email us. We do read those. And as the answers come in, Carol, what's it look like? Did we help anybody? Yes, quite a few said yes. A refresher definitely a benefit. Um, very helpful, absolutely refreshed, clarified. Uh, yes, good, very helpful. Re 